Our scripture passage this morning comes from the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the first nine verses of the 17th chapter. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up high on a mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and its clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I imagine that Jesus was tired. He was tired of the Pharisees and the Sadducees' requests for signs from heaven, tired of uncaring government officials and politics. Jesus was tired of all the people who followed him from place to place. And he was tired of his closest friends, especially the 12 disciples whom I believe Pastor BJ referred to as idiots last week. You know, he was tired of their inability to understand who he was. Yet in the chapter preceding our gospel lectionary passage, there was a glimmer of hope. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter, you know, the impetuous one, the one who was always quick to answer and react, allowed the Spirit of God to speak through him when he responded, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. To which Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Jesus revealed to his disciples that as the anointed one, the Messiah, his destiny was to go to Jerusalem where he would suffer greatly at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, scribes, and the government, be crucified, and then on the third day he would rise again. After hearing this, hot-headed and impetuous Peter the very same one whom the Spirit revealed that Jesus was the Son of God, rebuked Jesus, stating, God forbid, this must never happen to you. In that moment, Peter was being used by the spirit of the accuser, Satan. Peter had become a stumbling block, setting his mind on human things, not on the divine as he had previously. Jesus goes on to explain to the disciples that in the economy of God, it's much different from human economics. If you follow Jesus, then you must deny yourself rather than constantly seek attention and glory. You must take up a cross rather than seek comfort and convenience. And those who choose to save their lives would lose it instead, and those who lose their lives for his sake would find their lives again. These are all countercultural ways of walking in the world, especially today. So many people seek fame, fortune, and glory to be recognized for anything, anywhere, anytime, by anyone. 
Some spend so much time building themselves up and wanting to be crowned as something special at the expense of others that they don't realize um, or even maybe care that in the words of Jesus, the first shall be last and the last they shall be first. In this Matthew passage, Jesus goes up, to, up the mountain to pray, to step away from the crowds, those who were seeking him as well as those who were trying to destroy him. One commentator speculated that Jesus went up on the mountain to confirm with God that his divine assignment was to die on the cross, be buried, descend into hell, and to be resurrected on the third day. And that might be the case, but we know that Jesus would often steal away to spend time and to commune with God when he was tired and depleted, when he was about to face a new challenge or challenger, or when he just needed to be alone. And we know that Jesus had already shared with his followers that he was making his way to Jerusalem and would indeed die on the cross at the hands of Pontius Pilate. I believe that Jesus went up to the mountain simply to be replenished, to be fortified, to focus on things above. Jesus needed a moment, some space and some time to be with God, not to confirm his assignment, but to talk with his divine parent, to get away from the demands and the questions from the crowd, to settle his spirit and to prepare emotionally, physically, and spiritually for what he was about to face. Remember, Jesus was fully divine and he was fully human. Jesus experienced the same doubts, disappointments, emotional and physical tiredness and distress that we do. He needed some time to just be and to just be with God. Can any of you relate to that? Amen, I see a hand out there. Jesus took three of his closest disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And while on that mountaintop, they witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus. If they had any lingering doubt about his identity before then, when Jesus' face shone like the sun and when his clothes became dazzling right, white, right before they, their eyes, they knew that Jesus was something and someone more than just a carpenter from Galilee. And when Moses and Elijah suddenly appeared on the mountain from out of nowhere, I'm sure Peter, James, and John knew that they were standing on holy ground. ELPC, we've had some mountaintop experiences. Increased giving, a growing congregation, known by people near and far as a justice-seeking community of worshipers. We have a beautiful building and financial stability. And all of those attributes are earthly and human hallmarks of being on top. Yet those are not the attributes that truly define us as the beloved people of God. I already told you the economy of God is different. It's not dependent on having the largest endowment, the biggest or the most ostentatious building, the most eloquent preachers or the most members in the pews, either literally or virtually. What truly defines us as the beloved of God are godly attributes and commitment to kingdom things. You know, forgiving hearts, faithful, merciful, and gracious spirits, loving God, neighbor, and self, compassionate care of others, following God in season and out of season, and most especially when the season is inconvenient, worshiping God in spirit and truth regardless, and being willing and ready to have mountaintop ex experiences, not for self-aggrandizement, but as preparation to go into the field and be about God's business of feeding the hungry, setting captives free, walking with the marginalized and the oppressed, providing a place of sanctuary for the lost, the least, and the left behind, and speaking truth to power, even at our own personal expense. Jesus didn't ask for or desire attention, nor did he seek to shine like the sun. One commentator confirms this when she writes, Jesus never wanted a palace. He never wore silks, never got his face engraved on any money, never fell into or out of love, at least not as far as we know. Amen. 
One day on a high mountain with his three friends, he appeared to them to be shining in light, and they heard the voice of God calling him the Beloved. The thing is, she writes, he never asked them to see his glory. Instead, Jesus asked them to see his willingness to suffer and his presence among the lowliest of them as signs of the places to which God is drawn. The glory they saw in him was a thing he wanted to keep quiet about. End of quote. But Peter... You know, Peter, he was so overwhelmed by that mountaintop experience, the illumination and metamorphosis of Jesus and the presence of Moses and Elijah, that he just wanted to stay up there on the mountaintop a little while longer. Peter said, Lord, it sure is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And as Peter was still speaking, <laughs> they were overshadowed by a bright cloud. And from the cloud, a voice cut him off. <laughs> Before he could utter another word, and it said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, Peter, be quiet. Stop talking. Listen to the beloved. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and they were overcome by fear. As Peter, James, and John fell, Jesus reached out and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. Oh, people of God, to be touched by Jesus in the most frightening and disconcerting times. Oh, to be touched by Jesus when life seems off course and the next path and the steps are uncertain. Oh, to be touched by Jesus when we don't know what tomorrow, much less the future, will hold. But in the words of the old hymn, I know who holds my future. And I know God holds my hand. Oh, to be touched by Jesus reassures that all things, good, bad, indifferent, uncertain, and doubtful, work together for good to those who love God and are called according to God's purpose. Peter, James, and John looked up, and Moses and Elijah had disappeared from the mountain. They were no longer there. Only Jesus alone remained. Only Jesus alone remains. That's a word for us today. It does not matter who comes or goes because only Jesus alone remains. It does not matter whether there is an economic downturn or increase. You see, only Jesus alone remains. It does not matter who people say or think we are as a body of believers because only Jesus alone remains. Whether we are in experiencing mountaintop experiences or down in the valley below, people of God, only Jesus alone remains. And when we are perplexed, unmoored, in doubt, or even desire to stay where we are, only Jesus alone remains remains. Wendell Berry offers us a prayer about transfiguration. He writes, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. End of quote. Beloved people of God, it is time to come down from the mountains we have erected to ourselves and for others. It's time for us to be transfigured, changed, transformed, and go into the valley to work for justice and peace to stand for righteousness, inclusion, and acceptance, and to speak truth even when it hurts or doing so is inconvenient. But don't be bewildered by the brilliance of the past, experiences, people, beliefs, or things. 
because the transfigured Jesus, he's coming down the mountain and he's on his way to Jerusalem. Do you plan to come with him? Amen.